Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for taking time for joining us for this webinar. My name is Thomas Andersen, and I'm a senior specialist at SIGIS in Denmark. I look forward to bring you tonight's webinar on crossbreeding. Tonight's webinar is being delivered as part of the EU Dairy Network. This network includes 14 countries from Ireland to Poland and Finland to Italy. It aims to pull farmers at the center of practice-based innovations by sharing knowledge and solution. You can find more about Eurodairy by visiting our website on eurodairy.eu. Tonight's webinar, there has been 13, 31 registration from dairy farmers, vets, nutritionists, consultants and researchers from nine countries across Europe. Uh, tonight, Morten will run through his presentation, will, which takes about 14 minutes, and there will be time for comments and questions after the end. You will all stay muted throughout the webinar, but if anyone would like to ask a question, then please type your questions into the box on the left-hand side on your screen. I will ask Morten your questions at the end of the presentation. We will aim to finish within an hour. I would like to thank our digital manager at AHDB, Sivan, who is working behind the scenes to get this webinar running as smooth as possible. But please bear with us if we encounter any technical difficulties. We'll try to keep these at a minimum. Our presenter today is my colleague, Morten Cargo. Morten is working with development and implementation of breeding plan is in a position divided between Segus and Aarhus University. Late New Morgan, Morgan has worked on how to use sex semen as crossbreeding to improve health, fertility, and longevity, with which he will present today. Uh, Morgan, it all yours. Thank you very much, and thank you for having the possibility for presenting. Uh, an issue which I think are very important. And as Tom and said, then I have been working on this lately, but I have also been working on it for many years. I started doing my master's degree on that 25 years ago. So I've been into that for a period. Uh, we call this, had this uh, talk named cross breeding for improved production at the beginning, but that was of course wrong because it has to be for profitability because crossing is about having a larger amount of money to your pocket when you have been milking your cows. So this is about profitability. Uh, the outline for tonight is what is crossbreeding, the state of art, what is needed for a successful crossbreeding program, and some Danish and some international results on the, on the area, and then uh, some different ways of utilizing crossbreeding in systematic uh, crossbreeding programs at herd level, and tools for decisions making, and then at the end, some results from Martin Masson's farm, which is a member, he is a member of the group. And in case I have some time left, I'll give some similar crossbred results, but I doubt there'll be time for that. First of all, uh, I'll say how, which, where to put crossbreeding in, in, in management in a dairy farm. Management in dairy herds, there are a lot of different things you can change. You can change the feeding, uh, you can you can change the roughage production, then it takes a little bit more time. You can change your buildings and the technology to be used. You can change breeding and there's some other decisions. But the, the, the thing with these different types of, of, of management are the time it takes before they are implemented. Like feeding, you can find another sort of concentrate and then you'll see the results within weeks. When it comes to breeding, then it takes three to seven years before you see the results. Uh, and then buildings, it sometimes takes up to 30 years before you have at least they are paid back what you have invested. But breeding is so breeding is a middle to long-term uh, management tool in, in managing a dairy herd. Uh, what is breeding as a breeding as management tools in production herds? 
I think it's important in general about breeding to say we should not focus at single animals, at least not if you have a herd of 100, 200, 300, 400 cows, then do not focus at single herds, do focus at groups of animals. Use genetics as a strategic tool, put goals for traits to be improved. It could be with breed, do I want to have crossing use of sex semen and beef semen and the crossing is crossing is a uh, it was wrong way crossing is the the issue for this webinar tonight what is crossing yeah there are some principle of heterosis you know you have two breeds here a red a spotted and a black spotted one and the red spotted has a a, a genetic level of 700 kilograms of uh, fatless protein and the black one has 800 and then if we cross them and there's no heterosis then the offspring would have 750 but then if there is heterosis then the heterosis input is put on top of the average of the the genetic level of the two breeds here it you can see this by the blue uh, square here and in, in the case here then you see that the cross -put animals put, have a production which is larger than both the black and white breed and the red and white breed this is what we call heterosis or crossbreeding effects and heterosis is the superiority of crossbreed com compared to the average of the parent breeds as i showed you before uh, and heterosis works particularly for traits with low heritability uh, so it, it's it's traits like fertility calving calf survival calving yeast and health persistence. These are the traits we could, they are thought of robustness traits. So for these robustness traits, we have, do normally have quite a huge amount of heterosis. So which, so in case you're interested in this, then, uh, then crossbreeding is a very good thing to have in mind. And many farmers I know are interested in robustness of their cows. In general, we have, uh, a significant heterosis for, for many important traits we do have for yield traits like two to three percent uh, so not that much but, but positive heterosis for fertility and calving ease and longevity we do see heterosis uh, up to 10 to 15 percent and for total merit approximately 10 percent in when you view uh, have take a view of the literature then coming to our I'm, of course, I did not say that, but, but I'm from this very small little country called Denmark. And here we have uh, approximately 6, 000, uh, 60, 000 crossbred cows in yield control, which is uh, approximately 12% of our cows. The numbers are increasing. And, and this, we do have fewer random crossbred matings and more systematic crossbreeding, which is, of course, a good thing. But we are far behind New Zealand where they have, you know, 5 million dairy cows. And there, uh, nearly 43% of the cows, and this is a figure being one or two years old, 43% of the cows being crossbred cows, primarily between Hofstad Friesian and Jerseys. And if you take the, 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 the percentage of crossbred cows among the first parity cows, then it's about 50% uh, nowadays. So even though, it in New Zealand is at a high level, it is still increasing. So we will expect that uh, very, very soon it'll be more than half of the cows in New Zealand being crossed with cows, meaning two and a half million cows. But also here in Sigis, uh, in Denmark, in Sigis, which uh, is the uh, Danish advisory center, we do have goals for crossbreeding because we know that crossbreeding can give a better. Uh, profitability for, for in dairy herds. So there is a goal for 2020. So it's in two years' time that 40% of the dairy herds should use one or another form of systematic crossbreeding program. And 150,000 of the slaughtered animals should be beef dairy crosses. And we would like to go down to a replacement rate of uh, 32. Of course, some of you may say that 32 is not at all low which is not is but in Denmark the average replacement rate is like 38 so coming down to 32 would be a, a good 
uh, very good thing. But this can only be achieved with the use, systematic use of B semen in combination with improved management. But also crossbreeding, systematic crossbreeding can help us in that respect. And what is then needed for optimal use of systematic crossbreeding? An important thing is breeds which are economically equivalent or equal. Do we then have <coughs> breeds which are economically equal? One could say that the wholesome breed, which has been the largest breed in Denmark for many years, had been the largest breed in, in, uh, in Europe, in many countries, should have or could have outperformed the small breeds. So we saw in Denmark it was worth investigating that. Uh, so we made some comparisons, which we based on field data. And the, we have some names of my colleagues which have been involved in this work. We compared in this, what I show here, RDM, which is the Danish red, which is part of the RDC red dairy cows in the Nordic countries, Finland, Sweden, and Denmark. We compared this breed with the whole theme, and we used uh, those data which are put into the uh, breeding value estimation. We uh, so in our in this investigation, we had Holstein and RDC cows. We had only herds which within a two-year period had that where they were born 70 to 200 heifers. So it's quite large herds. We have information from three lactations. We do have a uh, use a two-year two two-year two periods from 2010 to 2011 and from 11 to 12. You'll see the results quite soon. When comparing these here, we see that we, we have only used purebred heads, so we have max 10% of cows, which may be from another breed than either Holstein or RDM here. And we are also looking at uh, contribution margin, where we do comparison of contribution margin uh, con uh, corrected for regional differences. And this is also the purebred differences, which I show you, is also corrected for, for uh, regional differences. This is done because the, the, the RDM herds and the Holstein herds are not equally distributed among the, the, at the country, within the country. What we see from these comparisons is, here you see you have two columns, it's the two year periods. We do see that in economics, and this is in Danish kroner, and for those of you knowing in Europe, uh, will, would like to have it in Europe, then you can divide by seven and a half. In pounds, I don't know exactly, but it's maybe between eight, nine, you have to divide with. But you see that for milk production, this line here, I think you can follow my cursor. For milk production, the RDM has, con this, the milk production contribute with less money uh, for the RDM than the whole thing, 180 to 240 kroner. But calving, fertility, mastitis, claw health, uh, other diseases do go in the right direction, meaning that they contribute positively uh, so that for these trades, there the RDM earn more money on those trades compared to a whole team. And then confirmation, which is, uh, I have to say, the, the Economic values we used for this is the economic values which we used in our uh, when setting our breeding goal. So therefore, we have an economic value for confirmation. Someone has doubt doubt in these values, but they are there, and and, and in that respect, then the the reds they 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 have an economic loss for confirmation trade compared to to uh, the whole scene. But at the end of the day, here you see in the first year there was uh, seventy. One kroner more for the host, for red cows compared to the Holstein, and the next year uh, nearly 50 less. So we are within a plus minus of 10 euro. But here we have to uh, be aware that in these calculations we have no uh, uh, nothing related to slaughter weight or, or slaughter of cows or calves or the value of uh, two or three weight old calves included, which in fact, would be in favor of, of the red. But I would say we do not see any differences here. They are These two breeds are based on these calculations, economical equal. Then we took 
economic figures from 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 the eco economic people at Segus and saw what is the income from milk and slaughtered cows minus the expenses. Uh, so the profit of a herd, this profit which is going to pay for 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 manpower and buildings. Here we do see in in two. 15, I have to say it's the same herds as we saw before. In 2015, the, the Reds had a little bit higher uh, profit uh, than the Holsteins, 145 krona. In 2016, they had even uh, even larger uh, uh, profit compared to the Holstein, nearly 100 euro. And then in 2017, the income was less, nearly 300 krona less than the Holstein. And it makes sense, the figures you see here. When coming to here in this year, we had in fact quite and quite okay milk price. And in in years with high milk prices, it's of course good to have a high producing halting cows. Then in years where where the prices of milk are low, then it's better to have a cow which is good for, for, for cost reducing trades. So, but overall, again, my conclusion is that we do have economical equal breeds the reds and the Holsteins. So thumbs up for that. We have made the same investigation for, for the Jersey breeds. Per cow, the Jersey do not have to exactly as much as the Holstein, but if you count, take the uh, count per, per kilograms of cow, then the Jersey is maybe a little bit better or is a little bit better than the Holstein. But we do have Again, breeds which are economical equivalent. Yes, and now to some of the results. We have in Denmark made uh, some results where we have looked into herds where they have both uh, crossbred cows and, and Holstein cows. So it is within herd, within herd comparisons. So these here, uh, so what we see here when it's uh, Holstein red crosses, then the the, the the animals we compare to the Holstein have half of their genes from Holstein and half of the genes from the red plus so they have an additive genetic level half being half Holstein half red and then on top of that some heterosis this is what we do compare here so in fact in case the crossbred animals are better than the Holstein animals then we don't do not know in fact whether it's due to a higher genetic level of the breed we use for crossing or due to heterosis. But at least if it, they are better, then we know that it'll be good for the farmer. So we have some different results here. We have in Denmark <coughs> crosses between, if you take from the left to the right, we have crosses between Fleckfee and Holstein. We have core crosses between Jersey and Holstein. We have crosses between Montia and Holstein and between ADC and Holstein. The thing is, that of course these figures here are most uh, accurate for those that of the combinations which are really many of, and these which have combinations which we have really many of is the RDC Holstein crosses, those to the very right, or the Holstein Jersey cross and the Holstein Jersey crosses. Then the, the Alpine breeds uh, in combination with the Holstein, there we now have, have so many data that we dare present the, the results. But you have to bear in mind that the results are more unsecure for the uh, Alpine breeds compared to the Danish Jersey and RDC breeds. When looking at yield here, yeah, then you do see that the fat and protein yield is, except for crosses between Fleckvi and Holstein, higher for the crosses compared to the to the to the to the Holstein in the first lactation. Coming to the to the thickened lactation, then the crosses, uh, the Holstein, unless for the Montbiar Holstein crosses, the Holsteins are better in yield in regarding yield than the crossbreds. But that the reason for that is that we know that the Holstein has a steeper increase in yield from parity to parity compared to other breeds. Coming down to survival, here you see that let's say this five figure here, it tells us that 5%, there's 5% more of the crossbred Fleckvi Holstein cows, which reach a second lactation, uh, a second carving than the Holsteins. So you see here, 
that are coming to survival, then the flick fee are really good. This are also the Jersey Holstein crosses, but also the Montpellier Holstein and the RDC crosses are better than the Holstein crosses, meaning that more cows survive to a later lactation. They, they, the, the survival to, to third parity, third calving is 7% higher for the flick fee crosses, 5% higher for the Jersey crosses, 3% higher for the Montpellier Holstein and the RDC Holstein crosses. And this figure has to be compared to the situation that in Denmark, at least 50% of the cows in general reach a, a third calving. So 5% more coming to a third calving is in fact a 10% increase, relatively speaking. And I have to say the results are from this February. Coming to fertility, then we do see that all of the crossbreds here, both uh, uh, in first and, and second parity, they are they are have a better fertility when 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 you look at the trade uh, days from first to last insemination. So there is from yeah in in second parity, there you see that the flex fee. Uh, the mouse is not the flick fee. Uh, in other mouses here, the flick fee Holstein crosses have 90% days less uh, in days from first to last uh, insemination than the Holstein. But all of the crossbreds in both first and second parity have less uh, days from first to last uh, parity. And we have to remember that these uh, shorter days. Uh, between first to last insemination, of course, result in in shorter days from first from from first lactation, first calving to next calving, and this shorter lactation length is not corrected for in the yields you saw before. You also see in the lower line, and this is only for first parity, that stillbirth maternal stillbirth is much lower for the cross, but compared to the Holstein. Uh, let's say for, for the where reds here, they are 1.8 percent point lower uh, the, the stillbirth rate than it it is in Holston. And one have to remember that the oh, normally the stillbirth rate in Holston is like seven eight percentage. So a reduction of 1.8 percent is a really huge reduction, relatively speaking, more than 25 percent. And coming to mastitis, then we do see the same. Uh, there's a reduction, except for, for, for the Jersey Montpellier in first parity, then, then there's a reduction for, for, for mastitis treatments compared to Holstein. So, overall, there is, in, in a way, in Danish herds having both crossbreds, if one crossbreds and pure Holstein in the same herd, we do see sort of good results for the crossbred uh, cows. Then we know that there's many, many people or dairy farmers are saying, okay, yes, yes, but we know that. But crossbreeding is only working in dairy herds at low management level. That all dairy farmers know. That's at least people say, but that's not true. I'll show that here. So we would look at this in practice. We'll see. We, we asked ourselves the question, is crossbreeding only beneficial, beneficial in, in pure herds? And we again look at the performance of Nordic red cross, Holstein cro uh, crosses uh, versus Holstein under three different production levels, again within herd. We uh, divided all uh, the cows, uh, we have data from Danish animals, we had 103,000 pure Holstein cows, 14,000 crosses, and they were from uh, over 400 uh, mixed uh, breed herds, and they were born between 208 and 214. But again, even though they were born in a span of, of years, of six years, it was within year and herd comparison that we did. And we divided these herd year. In, in, in high 
average and low production levels so that there was the situation that uh, we would see whether if we could find the same differences between the the crosses and the whole thing in those herds with high production compared to those with low production and we looked at both production fertility and stillbirth mastitis and survival here you do see the results for 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 our, for our yield we do see if you follow here in the red frame here that the crosses in high uh, producing herds had nine kilograms more than the than the halting cows coming to the low uh, production herds this difference was only three kilogram for fat uh, so at least here there is a tendency that the the, cro the crosses express a little bit better their potential in high production herds coming to to to, uh, to to protein we do not see that big difference it is none of these differences are of course big but at least we do not see that the crossbuds perform at a lower uh worse compared to often in high producing than average or low producing herds coming to, to fertility and stillbirth then we have the same story or one would say that maybe here yeah, one could say that if you look at at the first pair of days open then the at the high production levels hurts then the the crossbirds have nine days less uh days open compared to the whole thing while the, in the low producing herd has 16 days lower so one can say in this situation maybe there's a tendency that the crossbred animals can perform better compared to the whole thing in the low herds but it's not it's not significant <clears throat> and one could say a little bit the same with the stillbirths expressed relatively but you see in all both high average and low production levels with my mouse here uh, that the relative stillbirth rate is really outstanding lower for the crossbreds compared to the whole thing coming to mastitis there we in fact see uh, another situation it's it's also relatively uh, in in comparison to, to the whole thing just have some water but here you see that the that the reduction due to crossbreeding is larger in the high producing herds compared to the low producing herds and for survival rate from from uh, first to a second calving also relatively is in fact yeah at least uh oh no there's no tendency but so i would come to the conclusion yeah i should have put this in i would come to the conclusion that there's no difference between uh, heterosis or crossbreeding effects expressed in low average and high production herds the last thing we were discussing just before was uh, survival rate and then here here you see some some swedish results and i'll if you put look at the red frame here uh, it's results uh, from a master student called jensen three years ago we do see that the percentage of cows survival surviving up to second lactation and third lactation surviving up to second lactation is between two and three percent higher for the srb hosting crosses as well as the hosting srb crosses and for those surviving up to three third lactation or third calving this percentage is five percent for both srb hosting crosses and hosting srb crosses so again we do see quite a big quite a big uh, effect of crossbreeding for longevity also you may all of you know that there has been a lot of results from uh, minnesota state university in the group led by les hansen uh, here they have they have just finished a 10-year project 
where they had Holstein, Holstein, yeah, and RDC Holstein crosses, <coughs> and also three way crosses, Holstein, Red, and Montpellier. Here we have only results from the first level crosses. Here you do see that the, the crossbreds, they produce a little bit higher than the whole thing in these herds. And the conception rate for these crosses are, in fact, quite much higher than the whole thing. We have a conception rate of 38%. This is 46 for the Mopiar whole thing and 43 for the whole, not a great whole thing. And coming to days empty, we do see the same thing that the days empty is lower for the crosses compared to the whole thing. And survival to second carbon is uh, 84 and 83 for the crosses compared to 80 for the whole thing. So in a way, the same story as we saw before. Now, I think we have the newest thing, which is these figures here, they are from, they are not from these, the previous one was based on, on, on data from 10 large Minnesota herds. The data here on feed efficiency is based on, on results from the Minnesota, Minnesota State University. And they are based on, on the period, in first period from day five up to 150 days in, in days in milk. These results were presented at the ADSA meeting this summer. And in fact, there's also now coming uh, results for, for second and later lactation in a paper which will be published uh, very, very soon, but it's not published yet, so I'm not able to present them. But I can tell you they are <coughs> in the same line, they are in line with the results here. We do see that the rotational crossbreds between Holstein, Red, and Montpellier, the, the right uh, column, there we do see that the weight of these cows are nearly the same. They are at least not significantly different, but we do see that the feed intake in kilogram per day, in kilogram dry matter per day is higher, 1.5 kilograms higher for the whole thing compared to the crosses. But the yield are more or less the same, at least not different, significantly different. This lets up to the situation that uh, feed utilization expressed as ND corrected milk per kilogram dry matter is 2.01 for the crosses and 1.89 for the whole team, giving a profit per cow, which is approximately 52 kroner for the whole team and 56 kroner for the uh, crosses. So a profit which is like seven, eight percent higher for the crosses compared to the purebred. So again, this is interesting results. We have just made a little article about these results in Denmark here coming up. It came out this week. And I just that in that article that we will see the same results when 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 under under Danish circumstances or not only Danish but European circumstances. Then we have the results of France on the Montpellier. Here we see uh, that this is a deviation from Holstein again within uh, Hertz, and this is this is this is it all, uh, results from 2014. At least they were presented at the World Cup uh, conference in 2014, and there is an article one year later. But you do see that the Montpellier really uh, produce less when they are in pure breads compared to the whole team in first parity. And they also, they have an outstanding higher conception rate. But the really interesting thing is that if one crosses between Montpellier and whole team, they do produce the same amount of fat and protein as the whole team. And they still have the high uh, conception rate like the Holstein. Then also, in case there should be some people thinking that they are ugly cows, then you can look at these figures, they are not. Even though you are not at all, you cannot at all pay any bills with nice looking cows. It's about how easy and how good are they for giving profit to you. That's what counts. 
So my conclusion on, on, on performance of Crawford is that the yield is a little better than Holstein and the functionality, functionality and robustness a little better than the level of the color breeds. And then also an very important message is that heterosis works at all management levels. Yes, and then we should talk a little bit, bit about different crossbreeding strategies. All of you know the zigzag crossing, crossing between two uh, breeds. In there, you keep up with 67% with of the heterosis. Or you can use three way rotational crossing. There, you keep up with 86% uh, of the heterosis. Or you can use the combi cross there. And I may be too optimistic, or it's maybe not fair the way I show it here. There, for those cows being crossbred, they have 100% of their heterosis kept. But then within these herds, there are also some apurbid nucleus. I'll show it now. The idea behind crossbred is in step one that you do have a purebred nucleus, in, in the case here, a red herd. And then the, the highest ranking cows genetically are inseminated with semen from the same breed from the Nordic red. The lowest ranking is inseminated with Holstein, giving uh, two breed crosses, and you use sex semen here. And these two breed crosses are inseminated with a third dairy breed here, Jersey, giving uh, uh, birth to three breed crosses, you see here in the step three. And because you have used such a huge amount of sex semen in the step one and step two, then you can say, okay, but these three breed crosses only have to be, be used for beef production. So then you can inseminate with a, a beef bull and then produce some really good meat. And in these days where we have, and there's a lot of discussion about climate impact, then it's very important that our meat are produced based on dairy cows and not on, on suckler cows because production of meat on dairy cows are so much more climate friendly than production of, of beef on, on suckler cows. The idea behind the combi cross is that you, you, you take advantages of both pure breeding and cross breeding and they are combined. And the level of the pure breed nucleus is increased due to the, the in, intensive use of sex semen there. And the functional F1 animals, those in step two and three, express their full heterosis. That's why I said that there were 100% heterosis expressed, but only in the, uh, uh, those uh, F1 animals. And the tree cross cows give birth to beef crosses. The distribution of animals using combi cross in a 200 cow herd is that, in that sense, in general, there can be seven, seven, 70 purebred cows, uh, 50 two-bred crosses, and 80 three-bred crosses. And then, of course, you are able to produce also 80 beef cross per year. This distribution of cows are, of course, depending on the conception rate at your, in your herd, both among heifers and cows, the replacement rate, and the frequency of live-born heifer calves reaching first calving. In fact, this figure, the frequency of live-born heifer calves reaching first calving is of importance. And many of you may think that this is a figure being nearly 100%, but I can tell you, in most cases, this figure is between 80 and 85 or even lower. So it is a place where you can have a look in your own herd do you how big a frequency of your live born heifer calves do in fact reach calving first calving and then of course the distribution is depending on the use of sex semen now i'll come to the result from martin masson which has a, a dairy herd at sealand uh, the eastern part of denmark here it is to see some of his crossbred cows martin has a it's martin here on the figure with, with one of his uh, half building blue calves he has a dairy herd of 230 cows. They, it's a high yielding herd, more than 11,000 kilograms of ND corrected milk per cow year. <clears throat> Martin has been involved in the combi cross project for seven years. It's a project where we try to test the effect of the combi cross concept. 
In his herd, he has 65% uh, cross for cows, and he used for his heifers, he used 97% uh, sex semen. So all his heifers are inseminated with sex semen. For the cows, this ratio is 25%, but then he has room for 58% beef semen for the cows. His breeding strategy is come across. He has a nucleus of Holstein and then followed by red and jersey and then beef. In most cases, I think he make <coughs> some uh, exceptions for, for the heifers. So some of, some of the jersey red Holstein heifers are not inseminated with beef, but are not their breed. Martin's results are in fact really good. You see here that for kilograms of fat and protein, then uh, the RDC uh, Holstein uh, cows produce 20 kilograms more than the pure per cows, which produce 774 uh, kilograms of fat plus protein first parity. The Jersey, the Jersey red Holstein cows produce uh, 765 kilograms. And then the group at the very end are Holstein, uh, are Holstein, uh, no, are offspring of the of this group of Jersey RDC Holstein uh, cows. So it's a back cross to Holstein, but there are very few. So we should maybe not, I should maybe not have put them in, to be honest. Then coming to conception rate, there we do see that the crosses in Martin's herd have a better perform, a much higher conception rate than the Holstein. And we do see that the disease treatments, these are across the, the, the three groups. The, the, the number of disease treatments is 0.23 uh, per cow uh, for the crosses and 0.31 uh, for the Holstein. So it's only <clears throat> 70 to 80 percent uh, of treatments in the Holstein, in the cross group compared to the Holstein. I just have to say that these levels seen here in Martin herds are very low compared to average uh, treatment rate in Denmark. In second parity, in second parity, uh, we do see <coughs> uh, also uh, yield differences in favor of, of, of the crosses. And also, we do see uh, conception rates in favor of the crosses in Martin Thirds. The, the conception rate for Holstein is 32%. For the RDC Holstein crosses, it's 42, and for the Jersey uh, RDC Holstein, meaning it's those having a Jersey sire, the the conception rate is uh, seven, uh, 37. And again, ac across all the crosses, compared to the Holstein, then the the number of disease treatments is 0.35 for the for the for the crossbred cows <clears throat> and 0.46 for the Holstein cows. Again, a substantial reduction. Then coming back to down to the three plus parity cows, there in fact we do see that, <clears throat> and I don't know why, but the crossbred cows do not perform exactly as good as the, the, the Holstein cows. Uh, the reds uh, compare our RDC Holstein crosses yield uh, 800. 64 kilogram compared to the to the Holstein cows producing 921 uh, kilograms. But again, then the Jersey RDC Holstein cows have the same production as the uh, uh, Holstein cows. And in fact, the conception rate is now higher for the Holstein than the, than for the RDC Holstein crosses. But again. The number of disease treatments is lower for the crosses compared to the whole team. But then one I have to say, because what Martin tells and what we can see is that the cows, there's a better uh, longevity for the cross per cows, meaning that we do have more cows in three plus parity and 
it's easy to see from here, and you know it from back home, that older cows are producing much at a much higher level. Uh, here, if you take the, the Holstein cows, they produce uh, 921 in late in three plus parity, and only, not only, but 774 in first parity. <clears throat> so it's a big increase <clears throat> in production going from first to later parities. And as the holst, the crosses have a better longevity, then we have more cow have the high production due to being older. Martin's experience from, from, from crossing is <clears throat> what he say what he likes the most is the improved longevity. He say he has some calm animals and he has got the medium sized production animals. He before starting this crossbreeding had some problems with the with the feet and legs in his not totally new thing. And and this definitely like this medium-sized production animals. He has a good health status, and the important thing he has improved economy. And I think this is what I will I'll go back to the very because end with the conclusion. The conclusion is in most cases introduction of a systematic crossbreeding program will increase her profitability. And if you are, some of you have cows, so you have the possibility for increasing your herd profitability. Thank you very much. Thanks to Morten. It was really interesting. While I'm waiting for some uh, questions to come up, I would like to remember you that tonight's presentation has been recorded and will be available to watch back on the UDARI website along with other webinars from the last couple of years. Uh, and you just type in your questions in the chat part of your screen. Uh, Morten, I have one question. You have, you showed some figures from, from Martin. Yes. Where you compared Holsteins with the, the the crossbreds. Yes. Uh, the Holsteins, that's the best cows in Martin's herd, the isn't what? it? The, the Holstein group, he, he uses, he has a, a core of purebred Holsteins. Yes. So, and that's, so, 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 that's, his, yeah. that's his top cows. So the cross, yeah. Yeah, crosses, yeah, the Holstein part of them is. You are exactly right, I Thomas. Can, you. can you hear me now? Yes. I, yes. The, you are exactly right. The Holstein cows are out of the nucleus, so the dams of these Holstein cows here are the best Holstein dams. And then the groups of RDC Holstein, they are produced on the lowest ranking, genetically lowest ranking Holstein cows. So in case the, they have been equally distributed, then you would expect that the RDC Holstein crosses would, would be better, uh, or, or at least higher yielding than they, than they are now but so even though even though their dams the the crosses the, the dams of the crosses are genetically lower ranking they still can compete on yield if that was what you're after that that was what i was after um it all looks very good uh, but i don't see all the danish farmers are using comic cross what's uh, what's why is that why well, it's not going quickly into all the inserts? It's yeah, the figures looks good. Yeah, the figures looks good, and and but I think it has something. It has something uh, to do, in fact, with, with 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 oh, to be rude, one could say a little bit of conservatism, because and and but I would also say myself, if I had a purebred herd, which I have been working on for many years, I would eventually hesitate a bit. But then I would also say I would like to earn a lot, so I would maybe start with combi cross because in this situation I can keep my purebred nucleus and 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 work with this in case I want to do some pure breeding and then have the majority of herds of my herd being crossbred. But then, to be honest, I know those people which are involved in the in the combi cross project. Some of them say, "Oh, when the practice." is over i would like to go to crossing with all my animals because they like them so much and in practice they have a breeding plan with all the cows and and, and suggestions for sires 
yes, that that can be that can be done at least in the Danish uh, insemination plan program, and I would think that this is a situation in 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 other other countries as well. I would hope so, because I I'm I'm sure, and and that we have seen in Denmark as well, that the number of of, of crossbreds are steadily going up. Uh, let's say eight, ten years ago, it was the number of crossbred cows in under yield control was five to seven percent. Now it's twelve percent. But out of these twelve percent, a very little part is due to random mating. Now it's systematic crossbreeding. Before it was some random, random or matings or herds which were in breed in in changing changing breeds. But it is increasing bits by bits. Um, Martin is using Jersey. Um, some of his his crosses are they smaller than the Holsteins, or is there any backside of this? They are smaller. They they are smaller, and and this has been this is maybe in some cases for some farmers the lower the the lower size of the jerseys is a drawback. But Martin says it's from from his point of view it's it's not a big problem, and but but but. In fact, he has decided now, I think, to change from Jersey as the third breed going to Montbiar. But it's not due to size. It's because he sells his his uh, uh, calves for, for a slaughter pro pro producer, which, of course, like maybe Montbiar a little bit better than Jersey. But regarding size, then we have another of our our, our demonstration herds. She, used, has, she has a whole thing, nucleus, and then she used Jersey as her second breed. And in fact, these cows we have measured. And we know that these, uh, if one Jersey Hofting crosses is seven to nine, in average, seven to nine centimeters lower than the Hofting cows. But she has a, a, a milking robot. It's a robot herd. She has, she has not at all registered any problems in relation to the robot due to size of cows. Interesting, certainly. Um, we have seen that Martin is using uh, Holstein and uh, speaking red and Jersey or and shifting to Montreal. Do you have any recommendations on, on reds or don't do there? Yeah, uh, under Danish circumstances, I always say that we we need to have either the Holstein as the starting breed, or or if if start with Jersey or Red, then it should be the second breed because you do get really a lot of yield from the Holstein breeds. It's it's a very very nice breed. We do have three really really nice breeds, and they have different uh, strengths. And these this is the strength that we want to use. And in case that you would also, as Martin now want to focus a bit also on. On, on really strength of the calf, then it goes to the to the Montbiar and the Procross concept, which is used very much around in the world. But we also have heard that's why using flick feed, that's why I could show the the the, the figures. And this is in case that you really want to focus on 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 the dual purpose thing and the meat production. Then of course the flick feed is a good breed. But of course it's not the it's a milking flick feed of which we have two million cows, and nearly one and a half, two million cows uh, in, 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 in Bavaria, Austria, and Switzerland. So the recommendation, okay. the recommendation, hey. oh, sorry. Try again. Yeah, the recommendations uh, for, for which the way of to use in which row to use the breeds is in a way depending on, on on what the farmers want, and I think that's what I really like with with crossbreeding. It's, it's sort of the flexibility that I can use uh, this way of crossing the animals. I can use this as a management tool, and I can eventually also say that it could be that let's say Martin say I use I have a nucleus of Holstein, I have, then I use the, uh, the Nordic Red. Uh, as a second breed, and then I say, okay, I would really, really like to have small calves out of the heifers. So I used Jersey for the heifers 
to produce uh, so, so that the first pair of cows have an easy calving and then the older cows are used more PR on. So there's many ways of combining and try to solve maybe if you have if you have some problems with with stillbirth at the first pair of cows, then you could put on jersey and reduce this problem. Okay, uh, if there's any questions, please type them in. If not, we will soon close the webinar. I'm not getting that much questions. Uh, Sorry, do you have Thomas, anything else? To... There is a few questions um, in your questions box. Um, so there's one, are you looking into feed efficiency um, moving into Montefalia? What? Sivan, I cannot see the questions, but please ask them. Oh, okay, sorry. Um, so there's a few questions come through. Um, so the first one, is there a big difference in the size in the herd? Uh, yeah, yeah. I think I think this is in relation. I think this is in relation to the jerseys. And yes, there are there are differences, but uh, we saw at this demonstration herd, as I mentioned before, that the the Jersey Holstein crosses had, was seven to nine centimeters lower than the Holsteins. And but we have in fact also done these investigations under Danish circumstances, in uh, based on these cows uh, have been uh, uh, treated or, or or measured for their confirmation. And we do see the same thing that that using using uh, jerseys, there's a reduction of seven to nine centimeters in, in size for the F1 crosses. Then we have to say we have seen the same or seen results from from US as well uh, on size between Holstein and Jersey crosses. And there, in fact, the difference is smaller because the US jersey is a bit higher uh, in stature compared to the Danish. Uh, no, 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 sorry, the US jersey are higher compared to the Danish jersey. So, so, but there can be, there can be difficulties, but I would say, as I hear, then there's fewer which report these problems than I respect, than I expected, in fact. Okay, great, thank you. Um, another question. Um, are there some index like NTM coming in for crosses? In this this question, I'm really happy for because we are we are working uh, on a project together with with with, with the people in in France uh, to try to as a, as a starting point to to make a it's not it's not a real NTM or a real total French total merit index but we try for yield to transfer the 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 the, the information from from France to Denmark so we'll be able to to make a score for the females the crossbred females for both in the first at the first part here for production for fertility and for somatic cell score and this we hope to be able to do uh, at the end of this year then in the in a three to four year period i expect that we will be able to have dynamic breeding values for for the crossbred cows but there we are not yet but there are different products which would look into that problem which and because that will give us the good solution but i'm looking forward to to, to our first step here being able to have a I would not call it a breeding value, but I would call it a breeding score, which you can use for, for ranking your females within herds. And that is what is needed in a systematic crossbreeding program. Great, thank you. Um, I've only got one more question here, Thomas. So um, I'll pass back to you after I've asked this one. Um, are you looking into feed efficiency um, moving into Mount Belliard? Uh, in Denmark, in Denmark, in fact, we we are not uh, the, the the feed efficiency there for the Montbriar was done in 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 uh, in Minnesota at the University of Hurt. Uh, it is very interesting that there seems to be a tendency 
that these more dual purpose type cows maybe have a little bit the tendency that they have a little bit better feed efficiency. And that's why we also, in fact, here in Denmark are setting up a, a uh, research program where we'll want to test Holstein, RDC, and then cross between RDC and Holstein for feed efficiency. Because as we all know, feed efficiency are so important. And these results I have just seen, uh, which will be published in Journal of Dairy Science at the end of this year for Minnesota, I think are very promising. So we would like to, I would like to, and I think researchers here in Europe really want to dig into that problem because it's a big importance. Okay. A big thanks to all of you for listening. I think we had a great turnout and uh, and um, a good dialogue. Uh, in the next couple of months, there will be a lot of field dairy activities, starting with two webinars next week. Please keep an eye on the field dairy website for more information. A very special thanks to Morten for taking his time to share his experience with crossbreedings. Uh, and to Sivan for asking the questions. Uh, the recording of this webinar will be available to watch back on the UDA website in dual courses. All of those that have registered will receive an email alerting you when the live is on the website. Thank you all.